A couple of weeks ago, I got to preach on the most Presbyterian of passages in Ephesians chapter 2. This week, I get to preach on one of the least Presbyterian passages. Ephesians 3 is a powerful passage where Paul speaks about the profound mystery of, uh, that, of Christ that has been revealed. And in this section, Paul is going to emphasize the unique role of God's plan, explaining how the gospel is not only for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. And that's a revolutionary concept, especially at the time that this was written. Paul's ministry, which was grounded in grace, unveils hidden mysteries which had been concealed for ages. We Presbyterians, we like our facts and our data. And so the idea of a mystery can sometimes be difficult for us to grasp. But the focus here is on God's eternal purpose in bringing all people, Jew and Gentile together, into one body through Christ. And Paul reflects on his suffering, which he views not as a defeat, but as part of the glory and advancement of God's kingdom. And this passage highlights the boundless great riches of God's grace and the spiritual inheritance that believers, regardless of their background, share in Jesus Christ. So let's look now at Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, <clears throat> for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which, is not, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through him, faith in him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you therefore not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory." The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's go to him in a brief word of prayer, and we'll dig in. Gracious Heavenly Father God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for bringing us together here today to worship you in spirit and in truth. Now be with us and expand our hearts and minds to understand your word. And Father, be with the one who speaks. He's a vile sinner, but he has an amazing Savior. And now, Father, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. If you're like me at all, you enjoy a good mystery. And whether it's a classic whodunit or an unfolding secret, there's something captivating about uncovering that which is hidden. Now, one of the most beloved mystery-solving teams from my childhood was Scooby-Doo and his gang. And week after week, Scooby and Shaggy, Fred, Daphne, and Velma would take on strange cases only to reveal that the spooky ghost or the monster was just someone in disguise. And the mystery would always be unraveled by the end of the episode and we would breathe this sigh of relief knowing that the answer to the puzzle had been discovered by those meddling kids. In Ephesians 3, the apostle Paul talks about a mystery unlike any other. Not a temporary disguise, but one that has eternal consequences and divine significance. Paul speaks of the mystery of Christ, something once hidden but now revealed through God's grace, not just to the Jewish people, but to all of humanity. And so first we see in the first six verses the revelation of the mystery. And Paul begins by explaining that the mystery of Christ was hidden for ages past, but has now been made known by the Holy Spirit. 
And specifically that mystery is that Gentiles, non-Jews, are now fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers in the promise through, of Christ through the gospel. This is a great mystery. But there are other mysteries that are out there throughout Scripture as well. Things that we need to be able to wrestle with as believers in Jesus Christ. We, we can look at the mystery of the Trinity. It's one of the greatest mysteries of, in Christian theology is this doctrine. The belief that God exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but is one in essence. Scripture presents God as one in Deuteronomy 6. But it also, and it also reveals the distinct roles of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in creation, redemption, and sanctification. And we get to see a picture of the Trinity at the baptism of Jesus. This mystery is beyond full human comprehension and yet is foundational to Christian belief. And then we have the mystery of the incarnation, God becoming flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, fully divine, taking on a human nature and living among us. The question is, how can God be 100% God and 100% man at the same time? And it is a central doctrine of the faith. And for us, it is a mystery because we, as well as we could try to explain it, we will always fall short. But it speaks to the profound love that Christ has and God has for humanity and his desire to dwell with them. Paul also talks in Ephesians 5 about the mystery of Christ and the church and how this love and unity between Christ and his people are, mar are mirrored in the marriage covenant, revealing the deep bond of self-giving love that Christ has for his church. And this mystery also points toward the eschatological union of Christ and his bride at the end of time. Or how about the mystery of God's sovereignty and human responsibility? The Bible teaches that God is in control of all of creation, and yet the responsibility of humans to make choices and live righteously is there as well. How do those two things exist? How do they coexist? And while we may not fully understand how God's predetermined plan works alongside human free will, the Bible affirms that both are true. How about the mystery of the resurrection and eternal life? The resurrection of the dead and the promise of eternal life are, are mysteries for us to think through. Paul calls it a mystery when describing this transformation in 1 Corinthians 15 of what will occur at the end of time when the dead are raised and the living are changed. Now, how God is going to do that and grant eternal life and give us these perfect bodies that go with our immortal souls is one of the great mysteries of how, what that's like. My running joke is, I hope that my perfect body will be at least six foot six. <laughs> or how about the mystery of suffering and evil? The question of why God allows suffering and evil in the world is a profound mystery that has troubled believers for millennia. Scripture affirms that God is good and sovereign in places like Psalm 73 or Romans 8, but it also acknowledges the reality of evil and suffering. And so the mystery lies in understanding how God's purposes are fulfilled even through the presence of sin and hardship, as exemplified by the story of Job or by Paul himself. And that leads us to the mystery of the gospel that Paul is talking about here in Ephesians 3. This mystery regarding God's plan to include both Jews and Gentiles in his salvation through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> For centuries, that truth had been hidden. Even though there were parts of the Old Testament that looked at it, for whatever reason, the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, did not get it, did not understand this promise is meant for more than just us. But now we see that grace and mercy is extended to all people regardless of their background. And the mystery of the gospel includes our unity in Christ. This is a key revelation, is that God's salvation is for all people. The dividing wall between Jew and Gentile has been torn down. And it's a great mystery 
that through Christ, people of every background, culture, and ethnicity are brought together in one family. Imagine walking into a room and closely, like, like a couple of inches away, viewing this large tapestry hanging on a wall. At first glance, as you're that close, all you can see is maybe the individual different threads that are out there. Some are bright and brilliant. Some are a little bit duller. Some are thick. Some are thin. And these threads on their own seem disjointed and unrelated. But as you step back and you take in the whole picture of what is there, you realize that they come together to form a stunning masterpiece. In the same way, God is weaving together people from every nation, tribe, and tongue, each person like a thread in his divine tapestry. In the Old Testament, God was working through Israel, but the fuller picture, the great mystery hidden for ages, is that he always planned to bring in every people group into this grand design through Jesus Christ. The dividing wall is gone But in Christ, the wall has been torn down. And now these threads are woven together, creating unity where there was once division. And the beauty of the gospel is that no matter where we come from, no matter our background, culture, ethnicity, socioeconomic group, we are now part of the same family, being woven into God's great plan for redemption. Because we have grace in this revelation. We have received the gospel as a gift, not something that we earn or that we achieve. God's grace opens our eyes to the beauty and scope of his plan. And this is a humbling truth for us to know that we are included in this family based completely upon God's initiative. Paul then moves in in verses 7 through 10 to talk about the power of this mystery. Paul moves from the revelation of it to the power that undergirds it. He was made a servant of the gospel by the gift of God's grace given through the working of his power. The mystery of Christ isn't merely theoretical. It is backed by God's dynamic transforming power. And this transforming power, Paul is an example of that himself. He was once a persecutor of the church. In fact, he was on on the road to Damascus. He was on his way to capture and kill believers in Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus met him on that road and transformed him. Not a result of Paul's own effort. If anything, Paul was actively against God in that instance. But it's of God's mighty work in him. The mystery of Christ, when revealed to us, has the same effect. It transforms us from the inside out. The gospel isn't just new information, it's a power for new life. This power of the gospel is vividly exemplified in the life of John Newton. In his early years, John Newton was was deeply involved in the transatlantic slave trade, a, a profession marked by brutality and inhumanity. But after a profound personal encounter with Jesus, he went under under a radical transformation. And he not only abandoned that lifestyle, but he became an active abolitionist and a preacher as well. And his conversion led him to pen the renowned hymn, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, That Saved a Wretch Like Me. The gospel's power is the ability to affect profound change in individuals' hearts and lives. Paul writes about this in Romans 12. Do not be conformed by this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This transforming is not merely a superficial alteration, but a deep inward change that aligns a person's life with the will and character of God. And when we embrace this gospel transformation power, it invites us to undergo continual renewal, allowing the Holy Spirit to mold and shape us into the image of Christ. This process that we call sanctification, it's challenging, no doubt, but it leads to a life of purpose and joy 
an eternal hope. Verses 9 through 10 also reveal something kind of astounding. It talks about the purpose of this mystery being revealed is not just for human benefit, but also to display God's manifold witness to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. I'm not exactly sure what that means. <laughs> but I know it's true. The church as a united body of believers becomes a living testimony of God's wisdom and power showing all, to all of creation the brilliance of God's plan. And finally, we see the mission of the mystery. Paul concludes his, this writing in Ephesians 3 by pointing to this mission and purpose of the mystery that he's been talking about. God's plan was always that he would accomplish through Jesus Christ and through faith in him that we could be able to approach God with freedom and confidence. But that could only come from the work of Jesus. It's amazing that it says here, we are given the opportunity to be, have boldness and access. We, we are no longer distant from God. We are no longer under judgment if we are in Christ. In Christ, we are adopted as children and we can approach the throne with confidence knowing that we are fully loved and accepted. Again, this is one of the most profound mysteries that through Jesus Christ, we can now come with boldness to the throne of the creator of all things. Just imagine it from our point of view if we were living in a monarchy. You nor I would be able to just randomly go into the throne room. We would be captured. We would be stopped by whatever secret service or whatever you have in a monarchy. Uh, King's guard. Uh, whatever. We would be stopped if we tried to approach. But the child of the king has free access and sometimes doesn't even know, oh my gosh, I should be doing this. No, you come running down that aisle. Several weeks ago, we got to see Caden uh, at the end of this first service, because he was going to the 1130 service, just come down the aisle with great abandon, because he knew, hey, this is where my dad is. That was an awesome moment. We have been made not servants, we have not been made just like attendees. We have been made children of God. The mystery of Christ has removed every barrier between us and God. We no longer are outsiders and strangers, but we are beloved children. But we are also beloved children who have a mission in suffering. Paul doesn't shy away from the fact that, he, that proclaiming this mystery involves suffering. In fact, when he's writing this letter, he's in prison. And his imprisonment could have discouraged the Ephesian church, but he encourages them not to lose heart. His sufferings are part of his service to Christ and the church. And in the same way, we are called to persevere in our mission, even in the face of difficulties, knowing that our efforts contribute to God's greater plan. And so I just want to leave you with these couple of application points. First of all, know that the mystery of Christ is for all. The gospel is for everyone. Everyone that you come in contact with, regardless of where they are, regardless of what they look like, regardless of how much money they have, the gospel is for them. And we are called to break down barriers or division. We also need to be good stewards of God's grace. We need to reflect on what has God given me? How has God gifted me? And how can I use that to benefit his kingdom? Not everybody can stand up here and do what I'm doing today. And that's probably a good thing. Uh, but <clears throat> each one of us has a gift or talent, something to do, something that will grow the kingdom of God. And then we need to understand that suffering has a purpose. Trials and sufferings have higher purpose in God's plan. And we have to trust in God's plan in the midst of that because we are be <clears throat> being refined when we go through those sufferings. 
It's not an easy process, but it's worth it. The mystery of Christ, once that has been hidden, has now been revealed to the world. It's an incredible truth of what Christ has done for us. We're bringing together all people, all nations. This mystery of Christ. And as we live this out, may we embrace the unity it calls for. Experience the power it offers and boldly engage in the mission that it calls us to go towards. Amen and amen.